right, at the 202 mark, which should be coming up just about now. Let's get, we'll get started. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name again, for those who are just joining, is Vineet Bande. Um, very excited to be um, hosting the um, second professional development webinar of the school's fiscal year. Um, we have Professor Riley who will be giving a uh, talk on the concept of understanding slum health, research versus action. Um, so just want to walk you through the agenda. Um, before I do, just, just, just want to give a heads up that um, the webinar is being re recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, watch or replay the webinar at your convenience. Okay, so um, I wanna start off with an ag the agenda. Um, I wanna get through the pleasantries as quickly as possible so that we can spend most of our time with, um, with our wonderful guest speaker here. But I first do wanna kick it off by sharing a little bit about the board of directors. Um, then go into a little bit of a bio on Professor Riley, and we I will hand the reins over to him to walk us through his content. All right, um, a little bit about the board. Um, so for those on the call, I, I, I figure that most of you graduated from the School of Public Health um, past the date of its establishment in 1953. Um, I, for one, graduated from the School of Public Health in 2012, so I'm fairly recent graduate. But as part of that process, um, I really found it to be a very rewarding experience to be a part of that school. And I thought to myself, how could I find a way to really engage with the School of Public Health outside of uh, my day-to-day -day work um, in, in my field? Um, and so I, I became aware of an opportunity to um, get engaged with the Public Health Alumni Association and Board of Directors. Um, I wasn't aware of this board um, when I was at school or even shortly after graduating, so I was very excited to apply and um, and now have served in, into my third year of my term here for the Board of Directors. Um, just a little bit of context about the board. We are a group of volunteers who um, who help you know, ultimately build and strengthen personal and professional relationships among public health alumni and students um, and, 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 and faculty at, the, at, at Cal. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on what we, we do, but from a very high level, there are four um, subcommittees. I, uh, what this, this particular subcommittee that's um, hosting the event is a professional subcommittee fo focused on professional development. Um, some, some sample of, of the other committees include scholarship, diversity and inclusion, and events and networking. Um, some sample events that we've had in the past and activities. Um, you may be aware of our diversity and inclusion um, scholarship pro Kickstarter that we do, we've done for the past few years, um, successful event. Recently, we've also had a cross school public health um, happy hour that happened about a month ago. Um, that, 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 that was hosted in San Francisco. It included um, Berkeley, um, Columbia School of Public Health representatives and alumni, and other schools as well. Um, if, you're very, if you're interested in learning more, um, here's the link for the website for either getting engaged and participate in a participatory role, or alternatively to even be um, a part of the board of directors. I, for one, as I conclude my role, um, in this third year with the, for the board, I, I it's, it found it to be a very rewarding experience. So with that, I want to go into a little bit about um, Professor Riley's speaker bio. bio. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, Professor Riley, um, we, we don't know each other very well, but I know you're, um, you must be a, a very, um, you know, a person that's willing to share their time, given that you're sharing your time today. So very much so appreciate that. Um, you know, just some context, he's the professor and head of division um, in infectious diseases and vaccinology at SPH. Um, he has several research interests that we'll talk to around, around several areas, but the one that we'll be focusing is, is on, um, you know, uh, around urban slums. So a couple here, just for your for reference, there, there are five bullets here in the middle if you choose to um, read through those. Um, I thought I'd also call out a unique program 
um, that I that I learned a little bit about from, from Professor Riley and on his bio. Um, one of the three three of his current projects includes the Global Health Equity Scholars Fellowship Program. This is a um, a project to train U.S. postdoc fellows and advanced PhD students to go abroad and do research related to some health. So I hope we can hear a little bit about that aspect during your, your talk. Um, he, he's also a physician by training, um, so a little bit of background on him. Before we start the webinar, a little bit of logistics. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time through the Q&A platform, not the chat function. Um, please mute locally so that we can be respectful and allow uh, Professor Riley to speak for the next um, 45 minutes or so. And we'll leave the last 10 minutes to um, for questions. Professor Riley, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to um, friendly interrupt when that time um, hits, in case you're unaware. Last but not least, it's being this webinar is being recorded, so just, just want to rehash that. With that, um, I'm going to stop sharing, and Professor Riley, I will turn it over to you to start to drive, and I'll let you know when I can see your screen. Okay, great. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to do this web webinar, and thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Mr. Pandey. Um, so, uh, the title of my presentation today is called uh, Understanding Slum Health, Research versus uh, Action. And this latter part, this uh, notion of research versus action is something that we in academia, uh, especially I think people in the School of Public Health constantly struggle with. Um, as many of you probably know, um, in academia we're rewarded for the teaching that we do and the research uh, that we do, and maybe some of the service work that we do here on campus. But we're not really uh, appreciated that much for any sort of advocacy work that we do. And uh, I, I'm a, a physician, so if I see uh, people who are sick, uh, you know, my natural instinct is to be able to do something uh, for that person. But um, uh, being in academia, that's something that I'm, I, don't often or can't uh, often do. Um, in fact, I haven't seen patients in over 20 years. Uh, I've been at Berkeley. But um, when I go abroad to do my work, uh, you know, I encounter uh, situations where um, I see people who, 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 are, who are sick or ill with all kinds of uh, infectious diseases, which is the area of my specialty. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel compelled to do something, but. Um, at the same time, I, I need to also understand why these people uh, develop these diseases. And so this is something that we always struggle with. And this is sort of the theme that I decided to uh, take in, in the discussion that I'm gonna share with you today. And so um, let me just ask you a question first. Um, how many of you can guess uh, where this picture was taken from? And I don't know if you have uh, the ability to respond to the questions I asked, but if so, um, chip in. Okay, so I guess uh, you don't have a way to respond. Uh, Professor Riley, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. So uh, I do see some entries from the- Oh yeah, I, I see them, I see them, okay. SF, USA, Bay Area, okay, great, well, you're still pretty far off. Uh, now I'll give you a clue. Look at the the sort of the upper central part of the photograph. What do you see there? What do you see? Let me take the arrow here. I don't know if you can see the arrow, the, my, my cursor here. Oh, I see. Somebody thought it was quite tower. Well, close, but it is a some sort of tower, but not quite a quite tower. Okay, let me give you the answer here. Okay, so let's see, I'm trying to go to the next, here, here we go. Okay, so this is Paris back in 1872. And so you can see this looks very much like what you thought uh, as a contemporary uh, um, uh, um, setting. Now let me, what, what about this picture? Where do you think this is?
give you two seconds. Yeah, well, somebody said Eiffel. Very good. Okay, good. Yeah, so what about this picture? Indonesia, India. Yes, India. So, uh, yeah, Sarah, Sarah, you are very good. You got the Eiffel Tower and now India. Okay, so uh, this is the contemporary picture, 138 years after that Paris picture. It's uh, um, in India, in Chennai, India, or Madras, formerly Madras. So I took this photograph when I was traveling there uh, back in 2010 during my sabbatical. During my sabbatical, I went uh, what I call slumming around the world and took pictures from different communities um, like this in the world. And uh, what about this? Where, where is this from? Oakland Close. Uh, this is actually, I guess some of you are from Oakland. This is Berkeley. Actually, right now, I took this picture, of course, just last year, but this is uh, right at the entry of uh, University Avenue into the freeway. And so I'm going to just tell you about this story because those um, pictures that I just showed you uh, share uh, many of the features that actually I'm going to talk about and, and also um, the conditions that people live in and those kind of uh, uh, that what's depicted in those pictures engender all kinds of uh, diseases that, uh, that we study. So, okay, this is a picture uh, that I took uh, um, going in from the airport in Chennai into downtown Chennai. If you, there's a, there's a bridge that you can cross uh, on top of this, uh, in this neighborhood called Saida Pet. There's a, there's a river that the bridge um, crosses. And if you cross this bridge at night, this is what you see. You see these billboards um, depicting the kind of lifestyle that a very large segment of the population in India uh, lives by. Um, I think you have to realize that uh, the, the middle class of India is larger than the, larger than the entire population of the United States. You know? So of course, uh, uh, these people are gonna live in the kind of lifestyle, uh, with the life kind, of, kind of lifestyle depicted by these billboards. But if you cross this bridge in the middle of the day, this is what you will see. So this is the other side of India. And the type of lifestyles uh, depicted by the billboards versus uh, uh, what you see under the billboards uh, are very, very obviously different. And of course, uh, these differences contribute to the type of uh, uh, diseases that we see in these two types of communities. And so uh, if you look at the urban population growth over the years, in 2007, for the first time in the history of mankind, there are more people uh, living in urban centers than in rural areas. And so, um, and, and the, the ones that are, uh, uh, in terms of the population in so-called urban slums, uh, this continued to progress to in increase over the years. Um, and the one encouraging news about this is that um, in the sustainable development goal of the United Nations, uh, there is a word, uh, the word slums is mentioned. So he says, this is one of the targets of the, of the sustainable development goal. It says access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and upgrade slums by 2030. So I say this is encouraging because this is the first time where a United Nations or a United um, the World Organization has recognized uh, the importance of uh, this, this issue and that they actually use the word slums. And so back in 2003, uh, there was a report that came out of the United Nations Human Settlements Program uh, titled uh, The Challenge of Slums. And in this report, they talk about uh, uh, various uh, characteristics of urban slums. And so this slum, the word slum actually has an operational definition. I know I think many of you um, maybe view the word slum as a somewhat pejorative, but um, it's, it's actually an official formal term used to describe uh, certain types of human settlements. Um, and so in a way, uh, the word slum was, um, um, uh, so may have been pre, uh, repurposed to sort of 
empower the, the, the people who live in these kind of conditions. And so the United Nations definition of slums include uh, the following. So these are human settlements with inadequate access to safe water, inadequate access to sanitation and other infrastructure, poor structure quality of housing, overcrowding, and insecure residential status. So if you uh, take these definitions, uh, then uh, as of 2003, when that report came out, there were more than 1 billion people living in these conditions. And today, there's probably close to 2 billion. So this uh, report uh, looked at the following um, parameters. So they looked at uh, dem demographic, spatial, economic, legal, and social indicators of the 1 billion people who were living in, in, on this planet at that time. And then they also talked about, the report also uh, discussed life expectancy under by mortality, access to improved water sources and sanitation, slum operating programs, poverty reduction programs. But what was missing from this report is obviously the health burden measures. Now, health burden measures are not easy to uh, really obtain from these types of communities. Uh, when in certain uh, communities, especially in certain places in India, uh, not even births get recorded. So if births don't get reported, then these people don't officially exist. They can get go to school, they can get identification cards, they can get health insurance. And so they don't officially exist. And so if, if they can't even get those types of data, how are they gonna get information about uh, health? And so that's the challenge. Um, so let me show you this picture here. This is a picture uh, of one neighborhood in a, a place called Parrot, Periosopolis in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sao Paulo, Brazil is one of the largest cities in the Americas. And this I just showed you. And what both of these places have in common is described uh, very well by a sociologist, uh, Gita Verma, uh, in her book called Slumming India. She said that the root cause of urban slums is not in urban poverty, but in urban health, urban wealth. Um, and I would say uh, urban extreme wealth. And that's what's also contributing to uh, what we now are seeing in the Bay Area and many other parts of the US, uh, in particular uh, Los Angeles. It's the extreme of wealth that's really displacing uh, many people into these kind of conditions where they're forced to live uh, uh, like, like this as depicted by this photograph. So let me uh, uh, go into uh, a little more into uh, a little more depth um, about uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, situation. So uh, this is again Paraisopolis in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm gonna hone in on that section, that's uh, the circle there. That's what it looks like. And if you look to the right side, you see uh, how uh, uh, this building, this building has swimming pools in, 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 in their decks here. And I don't know if you've ever lived in a place like that, but I don't think I've ever seen, even in the US, uh, buildings that uh, had swimming pools on their desk. And then this kind of community that you see on the right is separated by this little fence here to the kind of uh, human settlements that you see on the left side. And if you look closely again, this is a, uh, this appeared in a uh, magazine cover, uh, Revista. And you can see more closely the swimming pools in the decks and the tennis courts have more swimming pools here at the top. And this, this this community here on the right side is separated by this wooden fence here from the type of community that you see on the left. And if you study infectious diseases uh, in people who live on the right side of the fence, yes, you'll see kids with diarrhea, acute respiratory infection, tuberculosis, AIDS, sexually transmitted infections, et cetera. And of course, you see these diseases on the left, on the left, on the people who live on the left side of the fence. But in addition, you'll see these diseases that you will rarely see on the right side of the fence. These diseases like leptospirosis, meningitis, all of the viral hepatitis, vaccine preventable diseases. If people on the left side, if someone on the left side of the fence develops TB, that person is more likely to develop multi-drug resistant or MDR-TB. And then you, uh, I'm gonna talk about a disease called rheumatic heart disease, which you will rarely see in people who live on the right side of the fence and then advanced stage cervical cancer. Now, why do you think the women who live on the left side of the fence will develop advanced stage cervical cancer as opposed to the women who live on the right side? Well, uh, let me just answer that question. 
the people on the left side of the fence, the women on the left side of the fence are more worried about feeding their children than trying to get screened for their uh, cervical uh, uh, lesions. The women in the, when the, on the left are unlikely to undergo pap smears. Um, and so uh, uh, they, they end up uh, with a progressive advanced stage uh, cervical cancer. And so you can see just the differences. They're, they're, they, they live right next to each other, but, but you can see this huge difference in the types of diseases that are seen in these two types of communities. And that's also true, not just with infectious diseases, but also non-communicable chronic diseases. And so, uh, yes, people on the right side of the fence will have all these diseases shown here, including you know, cardiovascular or heart, uh, diseases, uh, stroke, diabetes, etc., and people on the uh, and, and same, of course, on the people who live on the left side of the fence. But the ones who live on the left side of the fence, when they develop these diseases, develop uh, uh, more advanced for forms of these diseases, much more uh, uh, severe manifestations of these diseases. And so, and that's because again, the people on the right side of the fence are screened annually for these. Uh, to, to actually prevent these types of diseases. They may end up having these diseases, but uh, these diseases are caught early in their phase of um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, chronic uh, diseases. Whereas uh, people on the left side of the fence, um, you, know, you can't just look at someone uh, and say that person has hypertension or diabetes or, or, or cancer. They, ha they have to be screened. So, um, it's, it's not until when somebody develops stroke that they're diagnosed with hypertension. It's not uh, until when somebody develops uh, kidney failure or blindness or some severe infectious disease that they're recognized to have diabetes. And so um, again, um, the, the lack of screening and uh, preventive care uh, more prevalent on the left side of the fence contribute to these more severe manifestations of these chronic non-communicable diseases. So now let me talk to you about what uh, we do in Brazil. Um, I don't have time to talk, of course, about all of these diseases. So we're gonna focus on uh, one, one disease, rheumatic uh, heart disease, and then just uh, briefly at the end, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about Zika, um, which uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, occurred as a major epidemic in the Americas in, back in 2015. So one of the uh, projects, uh, one of the places in Brazil where we we do our work is in Salvador. I don't know if uh, any of you have been there, but it's the original capital of Brazil. Looks like this, this is the old part of Salvador. Um, and uh, it's the third largest uh, city in the country. And uh, there are certain places that look like this, uh, which is a typical, what we call, call a favelas or slum uh, community. And this particular favela called Pau de Lima is uh, near the airport. Uh, of Salvador and it's located in the valley. And so, of course, during the rainy season, this whole area gets flooded and you can see the water mark uh, that can go up way up to here. So during these uh, 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 rainy seasons, people have to walk through flooded water. And one of the diseases that uh, they get uh, when they, they walk through flooded water is uh, what I mentioned earlier, leptospirosis. So leptospirosis is a bacterial infection uh, that's transmitted by an organism, bacteria called Leptospira, which is actually excreted in rat urine. So there are rats all over the place, and when they pee, and, and their urine gets mixed with the rainwater, the bacteria can then uh, bore through the skin as people walk through the flooded water, and, and then the bacteria can enter the bloodstream, they get disseminated all over the body, they go to the kidneys and uh, liver, and then uh, when it affects your kidneys, then you die. Very high mortality. Um, you have to give antibiotics right away when people uh, get infected. The problem is uh, the clinical manifestations of leptospirosis is very similar to those of dengue, which also uh, occurs during this rainy season. Now, with dengue, you don't need to give antibiotic, antibiotics because it's a viral illness. But with uh, leptospirosis, you have to give uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, and you have to give the an antibiotics uh, 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 very uh, quickly. And, and so uh, many of the people who develop the symptoms are mistaken for uh, having dengue and they're not given antibiotics, but if they end up having the leptospirosis, then uh, uh, they, they can develop uh, 
severe manifestations and ultimately uh, death. And so uh, one of the things that we did uh, many years ago is to try to come up with a diagnostic test that can distinguish rapidly leptospirosis from dengue. And this is something that uh, uh, we, we have now, a diagnostic test that uh, my collaborators in Brazil and also a collaborator at Yale uh, was uh, my postdoc uh, named Albert Cole. Um, uh, developed uh, in Brazil. Uh, and so uh, this is one example of uh, how when we can uh, actually work in a community like this, can ultimately uh, identify the, the needs and then work on the need and then come up with a product that, that may ultimately be beneficial for these types of uh, communities. So that's one sort of contribution that a, an academician or a researcher can make. So um, even though this was designed as a research project, we ultimately came up with a product that uh, may actually benefit um, the people in, the, in this community. So, so there's a little bit of advocacy work that uh, we incorporate into the research work that we do. So, but let me talk about rheumatic heart disease. So rheumatic heart disease is something that actually used to be very common even in the US, maybe in the, uh, or before the antibiotic era. So that would be before the 1940s. So, if you hear a heart murmur, let's say in my in someone from my parents' generation, uh, that's more like most likely due to um, this disease called rheumatic heart disease. Uh, but rheumatic heart disease actually begins with a very common uh, infectious disease sore th uh, caused by uh, bacteria. So that's a sore throat, and it's uh, the sore, uh, It's caused by what's called a group A streptococcus. Now most sore throats are caused by virus. But um, uh, if they're caused by this bacteria, uh, you have to be treated. And this is something that's, of course, um, frequently seen in, in small kids. Um, and so uh, in the US, uh, uh, small children, when they develop sore throat, are often treated with uh, antibiotics, even though uh, uh, in many situations it's not necessary because, as I said, uh, sore throat is most often caused by a virus. But, uh, because of this concern about the potential for uh, sore throat to evolve into uh, this disease, rheumatic heart disease, uh, uh, many children end up uh, getting getting treated with antibiotics. And of course, I have three kids myself, and uh, whenever my kids, when they were small, had sore throat, I ended up giving them antibiotics, even though as an infectious disease physician, I knew that uh, uh, that they probably were not infected with uh, group-based trap, but I didn't want them to get rheumatic heart disease. And so, so the way this works is, uh, uh, let me tell you, there's just a global burden of this disease worldwide now, which just came out in a recent report in the journal. Um, so uh, as of 2015, there are about 319,000 deaths due to this disease in, in the world, and then uh, about 33 million uh, new cases that, uh, that uh, occurred. Uh, um, and this translates to 10.5 million Disability Adjusted Life Years, or DALIs. I don't know if you know about DALIs, but this is a way to measure the quality of life. Um, and um, so it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not just counting uh, the morbidity and mortality, but really trying to understand how this disease contributes to sort of qual quality, quality of uh, uh, life when you develop these diseases. So these are the regions of the world that you can see where this um, disease is most common. You can see that they occur most, uh, they're uh, seen most frequently in, um, in uh, South Asia and East Asia, as well as in uh, Sub-Saharan African countries. So the way this disease occurs, this uh, rheumatic heart disease occurs, is, a, is that it's an immunologically mediated uh, complication of group-based trep sore throat. Uh, so what happens is when you get infected uh, with this organism in the throat, it, it induces an immune response. Uh, and of course, this immune response is uh, uh, by, by the host is designed to um, eliminate the bacteria, but, but the antibodies um, that are in, uh, induced by the infection uh, causes a kind of a collateral damage to the heart valves that you can see here on the right uh, lower side. Um, um, and so after many repeated episodes of group A strep sore throat, uh, these antibodies and also other uh, components of the immune system um, start uh, causing damage to the heart valves. Um, and so the hypothesis is that the, uh, some of the proteins or antigens on the bacterial surface 
uh, are similar to the type of proteins found in the heart valves. And so the, the immune system mistakenly start um, uh, uh, attacking the, these uh, similarly shared proteins in the heart valves. So after many years of repeated episodes, um, they get damaged to a point where uh, in, in some of these severe cases, the valves have to be replaced with artificial valves. And uh, so uh, what we know now is uh, that this disease, the epidemiology of this disease is changing. So in, in the old days, WHO uh, uh, showed that the prevalence of this disease peaks at the young adult age group, but recent studies from Brazil, um, the later studies from Brazil have shown that uh, uh, kids as uh, young as nine years can develop congestive heart failure uh, with my, what's called a mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, I have never seen in my, at least when I was doing clinical practice, uh, congenital heart failure in little kids uh, uh, at these uh, age groups. And so uh, this is something that uh, is really being seen in uh, many of these urban slum uh, communities. And it's a, it's a major uh, challenge to public health. And, and so, uh, one of the research uh, projects that we do, or uh, the research theme uh, of my laboratory is uh, what we call molecular epidemiology, where we sort of fingerprint uh, various microbes to try to understand uh, the association of different types of genotypes or their fingerprint patterns with uh, uh, certain disease outcomes. So with group A strep, uh, what we do is we can sequence the, this gene called EMM, um, and uh, then try to identify the different uh, genotypes, or fingerprint patterns uh, of these uh, different strains of uh, group A strep. And so in the literature, if you look at the literature, um, the most common EM types uh, that are reported are called EMM1 and 12. Uh, so just remember EMM1 and 12. But uh, recent studies from uh, uh, Australia have shown that, that, uh, uh, that the um, the diversity of the M types are much higher uh, in uh, group, a, I, group A strep isis from African and Pacific region countries uh, compared to the high income countries. So this, this is a, a graph uh, from, from the, this publication by Steer et al. Uh, and you can see here, uh, so the, the ones in red bars are those that are included in a, an experimental vaccine that was developed against group A strep infections. And so uh, if you look, uh, EMM1 and 12 that I just mentioned are included in the vaccine. So if you include these uh, genotypes in the vaccine, the vaccine can protect it, protect against uh, infections with these specific genotypes. And of course, the vaccine, even though it was uh, uh, probably developed with uh, good intentions, um, uh, it was developed with the kind of strains that are found in uh, uh, circulating in high income countries. And so uh, here, EM1 and 12 are included, as well as uh, other types that are prevalent in high income countries. But if you go to, let's say, African countries, you see EM12 here? Yes, it's, the, it's one of the highest uh, in the African region countries, but look, it's uh, just a little over 6%. And the EMM1 is way down here. And so if this experimental vaccine came to be uh, used in African countries, it would have uh, a much lower efficacy than than uh, in the high-income countries. Now, if you go to Pacific region countries, look at this. EMM1 is way down here, okay? But there's, uh, there's, not, there's no EMM12 in Pacific region countries. So this experimental vaccine will be totally useless in Pacific region countries. So we did a similar sort of study in Salvador, Brazil. Okay, this is a study that was done by former uh, PhD student, Sarah Tartoff who uh, went off to CDC to do epidemiologic intelligence service work. Uh, and then she's now a researcher at the Kaiser Foundation in Southern California. Um, and so she looked at uh, kids going to these three outpatient clinics in the city of Salvador. Two of these clinics uh, served uh, predominantly slum residents. They're called San Marcos in Quinto Centro. And then uh, 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 one comparison clinic uh, served mostly private privately insured um, residents, and it's called George Valente, which is located here. And the study was done between April and October of 2008. 
and uh, she looked at kids uh, between the ages of three and 15 years. And this is what she found. Uh, so if you look at the diversity, or, uh, as assessed by what's called the Simpsons Diversity Index, if you look at George Valente, which is the private clinic, uh, it was much lower, it was lower than the diversity uh, index of uh, kids going to Quinto Centro or San Marcos. And what was surprising to us was here. You see, uh, this is the publication uh, from Australia that I just uh, I mentioned. You see the diversity index among the uh, kids in the high income countries? It's identical to the kids who go to the private clinic. And then the, the diversity of the group based trips trains from African and Pacific region countries are identical, nearly identical to those that we found in the slum kids, uh, slum community kids in Saudi. So, so what's going on here? Um, the, 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 the type of uh, strains of group based trip that we see in the slum kids, in, uh, in, in the high income uh, kids in Salvador are similar to the, the kids that we see in high income countries. And, and the ones that we see among the slum kids are, are, are similar to those that, that we find in African and Pacific region countries. And so, you know, in Berkeley, in the School of Public Health in Berkeley, um, we have uh, many um, uh, research projects going on, uh, uh, being uh, conducted by other um, uh, faculty members and students uh, on the sort of uh, the uh, contribution of um, social and uh, um, inequality on uh, health outcomes, so so-called so social determinants of disease. But here, what we're seeing here is that this, this disparity is already occurring at the cellular level. And so, yes, it's not just the uh, social disparity, uh, health disparity that we see at the social level, but, but the disparity is already occurring at the cellular level. And this is, some, this is a very illuminating observation that, that um, we, uh, uh, we found here, um, that we, didn't, we couldn't understand why this was happening. And so just to uh, sort of uh, depict the, uh, our results in the way that was uh, shown with, uh, in the Australian publication. You see George Valente up here. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, most common uh, genotypes of group phase trip, yes, just like in high-end countries, countries, it was uh, EMM 12 and 1. They, these two together accounted for 35%. And remember, these are the ones that uh, I mentioned are included in the experimental vaccine. But if you come down to the slum clinics, these two genotypes go down to 21% and 14%. And so if this vaccine became available in Salvador, it would have some effect for the kids who uh, go to the private clinics, but much lower efficacy in, in, in the slum kids. So even in the same city, this vaccine will have a differential uh, effect in the two types of communities. So uh, just uh, take a look, just please read this statement, which really describes well, captures well, what we discovered um, uh, at the cellular level uh, of group-based TREP infections. So this was uh, uh, stated uh, by Pankaj Mistra in, uh, in the book called Bombay, The Lower Depths. So let me uh, take you closer to home now. So this is uh, a study uh, of uh, uh, human papilloma virus, uh, which many of you probably know is associated with cervical cancer. And so they looked at the different HPV types among African American women who live in Southeast uh, region of the US uh, to, uh, uh, to the, those uh, seen in white women also living in Southeast uh, uh, region of the US. They looked at women with mild cervical dysplasia, their early precancerous cells, and they found these HPV types. These were uh, types 33, 35, 58, 68. Whereas in the white women living in the same region, they found HPV 16, 18, 56, 39, and 66. I don't know if you know, but the uh, but cervical cancer is associated with 
in particular with uh, type 16 and 18. And, and so the vaccines that's been uh, around ever since uh, 2006 in the US include type 16 and 18. And so uh, the vaccine that, uh, that there are several types of vaccines now, there are at least three vaccines now. Uh, the first two vaccines include um, 16, well, all of them include H type 16, 18. Um, but those vaccines, uh, if, uh, uh, if they were given to, the, um, to these African-American women in the Southeast region of the U.S., uh, it would be totally uh, ineffective because the African-American women do not have 16 and 18. And so, you know, many years from now, uh, we're going to see an increased number of cervical cancer among African-American women in the Southeast region of the U.S., uh, and people are going to say, oh, you know, this is because of all the inequality and racism and injustice and all that. And that's all true. But even more important is the fact that the vaccine uh, does not include the type of HPV types uh, that the African-American women in that part of the U.S. Uh, carry. And this is true also with uh, women with a more severe cervical dysplasia. Even then, 16 and eight, uh, 18 are not, not found. In, in, in these women, whereas they are in uh, white women. So the, the first uh, vaccine that became available is the, what's called the uh, bivalent vaccine, which includes 16 and 18, and then the quadrivalent vaccine, which now uh, many women have received in the US, include type 16 and 18. The good news, of course, is that the, uh, there was a new vaccine that became uh, approved, that was approved in 2014, that was called Gardasil 9, which is a nine valent vaccine, which does include um, the types of uh, HPV types that are found in African American women living in the Southeast region of the US. But I just want to point out that this wasn't really started until uh, just five years ago. So, uh, again, uh, I don't think the vaccine companies intentionally developed their vaccines this way, but I think they just didn't do enough homework uh, uh, to really come up with a vaccine that's uh, universally universally um, useful. And so I just want to point out how it's important to really do the research and understand the biology and not just, uh, 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 it's not just sufficient, it's not enough to uh, just talk about health disparity and inequality and justice without really understanding the biology behind what's really happening. And so uh, other studies uh, in Africa have shown that uh, African, African women do carry HPV-16. So this is something that's really unexpected, uh, that why, why the African American women in certain parts of south, Southeast uh, US uh, do not carry these types. Okay. So now let's uh, jump to 2015. What happened in 2015? Okay, so uh, yes, many of you guessed it, uh, the Zika epidemic. And this led uh, the former director of CDC to state, never before in history has there been a situation where a bite from a mosquito could result in a devastating malformation. The malformation that he's referring to it's the congenital uh, Zika syndrome or microcephaly, as you can see here. These photos were taken by my collaborator in Brazil, a pediatrician, uh, Dr. Claudette Cardoso. So, congenital, the so called congenital Zika syndrome includes microcephaly, uh, which is uh, uh, associated with um, intracranial calcifications, as you can see here. Uh, so these white spots in the brain are the calcifications, and then it's also associated with what's called um, uh, a, a ventricular uh, enlargement. So these are the ventricles here in the in the black area. Uh, they're enlarged. Normally, uh, ventricles look like this. Uh, these kids also develop seizure disorders, um, and then eye abnormalities. So these yellow uh, uh, lesions here, in the retina of the eyes. Uh, are, are areas of um, disease uh, due to Zika. Normally, the retina looks like this. There's also hearing loss, limb abnormalities, swallowing difficulty, impaired growth. And these kids uh, need 24-7 care 
uh, on the among the the uh, the kids we've been following in Brazil, uh, only one have died so far in the three years of follow up, and so uh, uh, they don't they don't die. Uh, and they just said they they need lots of care, uh, constant care. And so in February of 2016, the World Health Organization declared the Zika uh, epidemic to be a public health emergency of international concern. But by November of 2016, WHO declared end to the public health emergency status of the Zika epidemic. And in um, Brazil itself in May of 2017, declared end to the public health emergency of the Zika epidemic. So the epidemic may be over, but this is only the beginning for the families who now have to take care of these uh, babies, newborns with this syndrome. And so the question is, where do we go from here? I think we can't wait for alleviation of poverty, disparity, inequality. We've been talking about this for hundreds of years. We already know that these uh, things contribute to uh, poor health outcomes. And we can't wait for social capital development, technology transfer, UN Millennium, sustainable development goals. We really have to do something now to number one, just formally recognize the existence of this population. And as I said at the beginning, you know, in many communities, uh, people who live in these kind of communities are not even recognized to exist. You know, we have to really understand that this is a huge public health issue that we're going to, everybody's going to face at one time or another. We're facing this right now in the Bay Area with homeless populations that are uh, really, uh, it's emerging. Uh, we have to really, really, we can't just ignore them. They really exist. And then assess the burden of this disease in this population. We have to develop new metrics, the way to really count uh, what's going on with these uh, health uh, uh, outcomes. And then conduct research and report findings in international journals. This is, you know, I'm referring to people like us, academicians, um, because the local news organizations are going to not talk about uh, these uh, types of communities. And then provide data for national governments and identify and implement novel interventions, especially um, specifically designed for these urban slums. And then finally, get those in position of influence, set the priorities straight. Um, you know, as we no, in this country and in many other countries right now, um, I think uh, uh, the politicians really don't have their priorities in the right place. Um, and this is, this is really an unfortunate situation. Uh, um, and, and this led uh, one person to say, the main stock exchange go up or down three percentage points, and this is a world event. This is the kind of things we always talk about. So he said, this cannot be, it's time to flip the tortilla. You know who said this? That's another question I'm asking you. Let's see if you can answer this question. No guess? Okay, what if I say, what if I give you the name? Still no, I uh, guess, okay. Okay, so I think this is a, one person who really, I think, understands this. And I don't often uh, quote a Pope in my talks, but um, I think we need more people like him uh, in our leadership. And so let me just end now by telling you about the, uh, uh, training program that we have that uh, uh, Mr. Pendley mentioned at the end, at the beginning. Um, so this is called the Global Health Equity Scholars Program, where we send uh, American postdocs and PhD students who have completed their work, uh, who have completed their qualifying exam, to go to these places. So this is a consortium of about four institutions in the US, with Berkeley being the lead. So it includes Stanford, Yale, and Florida International University. And uh, they spend up to a year in, uh, in these sites that uh, uh, researchers from these institutions have projects. And they're usually uh, <clears throat> sites uh, looking at the uh, populations uh, living in the kind of uh, conditions that uh, I described in, in, in this webinar. 
<coughs> and so uh, if you're interested, just go to the site <coughs> and take a look. And uh, uh, this will continue for another, at least another uh, uh, three or three more years. Uh, and so if you are a potential postdoc or PhD student, uh, you can take a look. So let me end by uh, telling you, you know, thanking all the people who participated over the years uh, in this project, uh, my students and postdocs from my lab. And then I want to particularly thank Jason Corbin, who is one of the faculty members here at, the, at, the, uh, at Berkeley, who uh, uh, wrote, uh, co-edited a book with me uh, called Slum Health, From the Cell to the Street. So you uh, learn more about what I just talked about, uh, please uh, read the book. There's just an advertisement for my book, for our book. Um, we uh, titled it uh, From the Cell to the Street because, uh, as you can guess, I do the cell work, I do the biology, and Jason uh, uh, does the street work. He is an urban planner. He's from the Department of uh, uh, City and uh, Regional Planning and also a member of the School of Public Health. And he actually looks at the impact of um, uh, uh, just the, the planning of the cities, the, the urban planning on uh, health outcomes. And then I have many co collaborators in Brazil who've uh, worked with me over the many last 20 some years. And then, uh, and of course, I want to thank uh, Albert Cole and Warren Johnson uh, who uh, have uh, worked with me in doing these types of uh, work uh, in Brazil. So let me end here and I will entertain any questions that, uh, that you may have. Excellent, Professor Riley, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, thank you very much. That was a very informative um, discussion. I really appreciate your time once again. Um, we have actually a few questions here um, on the screen, so let me uh, go through them. Um, the first is from Karis Baz. Um, have you seen the RHD EMM type distribution by neighborhood changing over time? Or do you think this phenomenon is stable? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, we have not uh, uh, done that work, uh, just following the change in genotypes uh, in the same community where uh, I described. Uh, something that's, I think, uh, worthwhile, and we could certainly do that. But just looking at the literature, uh, yes, uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, there was a study that was uh, done in Chicago a few years ago where they looked at the changing genotypes over a, uh, several decades, and they've definitely seen uh, evolution of, of the genotypes. So uh, before the antibiotic era, there were certain genotypes that were considered to be uh, rheumatogenic, meaning that they were associated with uh, these uh, um, uh, clinical outcomes that are like rheumatic heart disease. Uh, and for some reason, they virtually disappeared from the Chicago area. I don't know if it's because of the antibiotics that have been used or some other uh, factors, but nobody knows uh, why these have pretty much disappeared. And, and that correlates with the uh, really uh, 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 virtually uh, absence of uh, new cases of rheumatic heart disease in the Chicago area. And so, uh, yes, I think that's seen, but we ourselves have not looked at that in uh, Salvador. Uh, that's something that we could certainly consider doing. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think on, on that note, there's another question related to things that you may or may not be exploring, Professor Riley. This question comes from Dr. Sanjay K. Pandey, who actually happens to be my dad. So uh, okay. thank you, Dad, for joining the webinar. Um, <laughs> his question is, recently bacteriophage-mediated therapy to treat some of these bacterial diseases which do not respond to available drugs are being pursued. Is there any effort being made in this particular direction? Uh, yes, so uh, uh, so this doesn't necessarily relate to group A strep, but uh, it does relate to some of the other uh, types of uh, bacterial agents that we happen to be studying here. And these are what's called group, uh, gram-negative bacterial infections. And uh, there's some uh, uh, you know, gram-negative bacterial infections that are really rapidly emerging, especially the ones that are um, becoming drug uh, resistant and very, very difficult to treat. And in fact, uh, we're running out of antibiotics to treat some of these uh, multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacterial infections. So, so there's been some uh, 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 cases where uh, uh, these patients weren't responding to anything that, that were available and uh, they ended up uh, receiving experimental phage uh, therapy and uh, 
many of them, some of them actually responded to, to this, uh, this therapy. This is something that's actually been going on for a long time in Eastern Europe and Russia. And I, I don't have any data from those places. But, uh, and then before the antibiotic uh, uh, era, this was actually uh, something that uh, uh, was uh, widely used. But because of the antibiotics, uh, the efficacy, because of the, the highly effective nature of the antibiotics, this type of uh, therapy kind of went out of favor. But, but it's uh, being uh, reintroduced in some places. I don't know how uh, this will evolve, but but there there one problem, of course, uh, with the phage therapy is that the uh, uh, people can develop resistance also to different types of phages, and so my uh, feeling is that it may not have a long term vi viability. That um, this phage therapy is probably going to face the same um, outcome as the antibiotic therapy that we're seeing, and so. I'm not, I'm, you know, somewhat pessimistic about this, but uh, certainly uh, it's something that we can we can try and and, and see uh, 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 if it can play a role in in, in the treatment of these really bad uh, drug resistant infections. Excellent. All right, uh, let me just get through a couple more questions in the last couple minutes here. Um, another question: Would increasing access to healthcare in slums help address the disparities that were discussed? Uh, yes, of course. Um, the, the the problem is, uh, it, 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 I mean, one of the major problems is the access. And but how do you go about trying to increase the access? So, um, in many places, uh, uh, this type of service is provided by NGOs and not necessarily governments. In other places, of course, governments uh, uh, get involved. Um, you know, let's just look at the homelessness situation here. We had this big outbreak of hepatitis A in San Diego last year. Um, we also have seen uh, the outbreak of typhus in Los Angeles among the homeless community. Those, both of those things could have been easily prevented if uh, some sort of um, uh, access to health care uh, was provided. Um, and so um, it's really a, a matter of will, you know, will on the part of the government and local government, but also on the will of the uh, general community. You know, many people living in the general communities don't want uh, these homeless people to be living nearby. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I think, uh, I think more people need to really get involved in, in trying to do something about this and, 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 try, and then try to provide uh, some way of um, uh, providing access to, to care. Absolutely. I think that's a, um, there's one last question, but I think that's a really great point to, um, to really harp on towards, towards the very end of our presentation. Um, speaking of the presentation, there's a question um, related to the presentation. Will copy, are, are, are you okay with having this PowerPoint deck be made available to students? Sure. Yeah. So. Okay. That'd be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and the last question here at, at the top of the hour is how can we get involved? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I just mentioned that I think we need to, number one, be aware of what's going on. And I think the best way to start is by looking at our own backyard uh, and, and see what's going on. Um, I think in the last couple of years, uh, more efforts are indeed being made by both the local governments as well as the community and NGOs. And I think it's a good sign. Uh, I think we have to recognize uh, obviously, that uh, you know, we need to provide uh, affordable housing for, for, for the people. And um, I think uh, you, know, you can talk to the local politicians, and, um, but also you know, business people. Uh, uh, the good news is that I think the business community in San Francisco uh, is getting involved. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, I think finally, um, uh, there, there's a real surge in the, in, in the interest on the part of uh, uh, government and the general, general public, as well as the business uh, community to really uh, address this issue. And so uh, we should all get involved in, in these uh, uh, efforts. Excellent. Well, there is our call to action and there's our um, end to the webinar. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. Professor Riley, thank you so much again for your time today. This is a really enriching presentation. and. Um, Really, really, really happy that you were able to provide your time today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.